Hey everybody and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host Ashley Mova and this is the daily show where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us as always is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations everybody. Welcome back to the best damn room movie related show on the internet. Coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California. And we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here, John Schnepp. Hey, I went to Seal Beach for the first time. I didn't know what it was. It was really fun. You guys should check it out sometime, <laughs> especially if you're surfers like me. This episode of Movie Talk brought to you by Seal Beach. <laughs> <laughs> also here is Mark Ellis. And the tourism department also wants to remind you that I was in Big Sur hiking this weekend. I did 10 miles. <laughs> with your mom. In one day miles. with my mom. That was awesome. Yes, That's there was. impressive. I mean, it was, it was, I was tired. I was more tired than my mom was. We saw well. a cougar. Mm. <laughs> Is it your mom? <laughs> I knew she was going to say that. I knew it. You set Ashley up. She will okay. knock it down. You hands off her, okay? You're not going to be my new dad. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley Mova is Mark Ellis' new dad in Flavor Time. All right, guys. Mark, I just want to okay. ground you for a week because... <laughs> Okay, okay. It's Monday, which means it's time for the Weekend Box Office Report, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Coming in at number one in an upset this weekend was Marvel's Ant-Man, which made $24.7 million at the box office, bringing its two-week worldwide total up to $226 million. And the number two spot is the new Adam Sandler film Pixels, taking in a reported $24 million. And third spot is Minions. The animated film brought in another $22 million to bring its worldwide total up to over $759 million. And fourth spot is the R-rated comedy Trainwreck, making an additional $17 million. And rounding out the top five is the new boxing film Southpaw, making $16.5 million. John, what stands out to you in this weekend's box office report? Well, actually, instead of looking at some of the top spots, going down to some of the lower things, Trainwreck only had a 42% drop at the box office, which is an impressive number. You're at, Generally speaking, you're looking around 55%. Right. Anywhere between 55 60, you don't want to go over 60% of a drop. 42%, that means people have enjoyed it, and the word of mouth is getting out there. That's pretty good. Minions holding strong. Like, I did predict that Minions was going to join the $1 billion club. I think it's going to fall short of that. I, I don't think it's got the momentum now to make up another $280 million, but still, $700 some odd million. Another nice payday for the studio. Obviously, the big surprise I think here is Pixels. I think, despite the fact, and we'll go more into this later, that you know it it clearly looked like it was going to be the number one film. Ant Man hangs in there, Pixels underperforms, but uh, Ant Man coming in number one, it keeps chugging along. So kudos on it. Schnepp, what stands out to you? Yeah, that Ant Man is number one. I'm very a pleasant surprise to see that because I I think that's the first time it is number one in, in its release, right? Uh, well, it was number one last week. Well, yes. All right, well, my mistake. Well, I'm glad it's still number one uh, just because it beat Pixels. That makes it even <laughs> more awesome. So, yeah, it deserves to be number one. for. And if you haven't seen Ant-Man, I'd say go see Ant-Man immediately while it's still playing in IMAX because it's really worth seeing it. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, it looks like Donkey Kong Jr. will not be going to private school this year <laughs> because that's that's really disappointing, not yeah. only for a movie that, that has Adam Sandler, who always has a great opening weekend, if nothing else, but this was Pac-Man. This was Donkey Kong, and those effects shots look great that trailer regardless of what you want to say about the comedy of it or in the actual film the trailer for pixels was a well done operation from an action standpoint so i'm shocked that it didn't find a way to wedge its way in there but ant-man does have the marvel pedigree and great word of mouth and minion still has the family with the more of the kids that want to go see that so it looks like pixels and an adam sandler film got lost in the shuffle train wreck i was happy to see how well that did and yeah. i was also happy to see how well southpaw did with some marketing yeah. but it, it, you were really just just relying on Jake Gyllenhaal. Plus, you had that trailer that gave away so much. I'm glad that people still went out to go see Southpaw because it is a very good movie, in my opinion. And Gyllenhaal's performance alone is worth the price of admission. I think it's also worth noting that I don't know what the overall box office, I don't know what happens when you have a tragedy like what happened in Louisiana, where people see that and then they're like, I don't feel like going to the movies this weekend. Right. So I don't know if that reduces how many people actually buy tickets in mass or if it's just something people see and try to get over. But I'm glad that as many people made it out to the movie theaters this weekend as happened. I think, I don't know if that I had that much of an effect because other than Pixels, mm -hmm. I think every other, I think I was reading that every other film in the top five met or even exceeded their projected numbers for this right. particular week. So, I mean, the, the one Pixels is a big drop back there. I personally didn't love Southpaw. I, th I think you're right though. Jake Gyllenhaal's performance 
worth the price of admission. Uh, and I'm a big Antoine Fuqua fan, but I, I mean, I thought this was one of his lesser performances uh, as far as being a director goes. But I mean, and Pixels, I didn't like the movie, but you're right. It looked great. Just seeing Pac-Man going down the streets in New York looks like something I'd want to buy a ticket for. Like, how can you make that concept even look feasible if you're watching on screen I, but and, and yet somehow they made a way to find this pixelated video game thing running through the streets and it actually looked like yeah that's what exactly what it would look like i thought it looked visually it was spectacular i thought i thought they did a great job yeah paper towns also cost like it didn't cost that much to make so i think it no. made its budget back but i don't I, I didn't see a lot of marketing for it i thought i would have seen more because it looks like that demographic is the kind that wants to rush out and see and support right. the book that they read the opening weekend but it didn't end up happening for paper towns for whatever reason all right what's next as we reported a short time ago, the writing team of John Francis Daly and Jonathan M. Goldstein have been hired by Sony Pictures to write the script for the upcoming rebooted Spider-Man film. In a recent interview with NPR, they were asked about the personality of the new Peter Parker, to which they said the following. He's a sharp kid and witty and kind of deals with the fact that he's an outcast and geek through humor. It is sort of the safety net for geeks like us, so I think we can totally relate to where he's coming from. Mark, what do you make of their description of Peter Parker? I think that it's it's on the nose. It sounds exactly like the other Peter Parkers we've seen, whether it's <laughs> Tobey Maguire or Andrew Garfield. Garfield's Spider-Man was a little bit better with the I'm awkward, so I'm going to use humor as a defense mechanism than Tobey Maguire's was, but that's the way that those various directors and scripts had that character. This sounds like the Peter Parker that we know and love. Now, will that make sense after whatever his role purportedly in Civil War is? And then we go to a standalone Spider-Man film where he is this shy, geeky guy who uses humor as a defense mechanism back in high school after mingling with these superheroes. That's the interesting thing to me is how is this going to tie with the Spider-Man that we already saw on screen if we get to see him a lot in Civil War? Yeah, I, I remember I was a big fan of the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man. Sam Raimi's second Spider-Man, one of the greatest comic book films of all time. But even in there, I never really sensed that humor from Spider-Man. Sometimes when the mask came on, he had moments of that mm -hmm. humor, mm -hmm. but we never really saw that as a natural part of who Peter Parker was. So it's almost like he became a different person. And Peter Parker isn't really like that. He doesn't become a different person with his alter ego. And so hearing them talk about Peter Parker, that he's really going to be embrace that part of him, the humor, maybe even probably self-deprecating humor a lot as a part of his defense mechanism for being the socially outcast guy, I think that's really right on target. And as much as I loved Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man and loved uh, Mark Webb's first Amazing Spider-Man film, that's also one thing I thought they could have probably done a little bit better so hearing that they're at least aiming for that they might miss completely but at least they're aiming for the right target and that gives me some sense of hope yeah i agree i, I really want them to be able to integrate both peter parker and spider-man into being the one character that he is and especially recently how he's written it's like I think the humor is a giant part of the Spider-Man character and you know him being able to jump around and say stuff to like throw the villains off is part of what was fun about the comic book reading the comic book. So I think this pair having not seen Vacation yet I'm still hopeful that they're going to be able to <laughs> nail it and uh you know and hearing that it's like you know they're that Kevin Feige wants it to be in that John Hughes sense of humor I don't think he's going to have a giant role in Civil War. Spider-Man will be there. Mm -hmm. He'll do some stuff. And I think that's going to be the, the dichotomy. of It's just a kid. That's going to freak people out when they see someone doing all these fantastic things that only a superhero can do. And he pulls his mask off and he goes to like, you know, he's a freshman in high school. You're going to be like, what? You know? Yeah, what's exciting when I read that quote is that because the, the other two Spider-Men that we dealt with, we had to sit through an entire origin story yes. in each one of those. And that origin story gets dark. I mean, his uncle gets murdered brutally. And so he's got to deal with all those emotions. Now, maybe if there's a little bit of separation between that tragic event and what he's going through now, he can start to use humor again. So we maybe see that infiltrate its way into the film earlier on than we did in the previous incarnations. What if, what if, just throwing this out there, I don't know how angry this would make some people. You know, we say, hey, you know, making movies, you should probably, you know, make it a little bit more your own. And especially if you're rebooting something, put your own personal touches on. What if Uncle Ben ain't dead? What if, what if Uncle Ben never died, and like Marissa Tomei is that right now, but what if we hear, you know, and we know how much of a connection um, uh, Spider-Man has with, uh, who's, who's the guy who plays Ash? 
Oh, Bruce Campbell. Yeah, Bruce Campbell is actually going to come back into the Spider-Man franchise, <laughs> even though it's not Sam Raimi, and he's Uncle Ben. I'll I tell mean, you this. I'll <laughs> tell you this. When Aunt May looks like Marissa Tomei, <laughs> there's always going to be another Uncle Ben lining up at the door. Right. You, there's there's going to be no shortage of male figures Maybe in Uncle your Ben life. is like the code name. <laughs> uh, so Uncle Ben's here tonight, Peter. You shouldn't be around. Okay, uh, I get it. Are you my new Uncle Ben? Yeah. And Aunt May's like, stop calling Frank Uncle new Uncle yeah. Ben. I told you <laughs> it, was a code, it was a code name between us. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down, and those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? A new trailer for the upcoming Zac Efron film, We Are Your Friends, has hit the web. We Are Your Friends is about what it takes to find your voice. Set in the world of electronic music and Hollywood nightlife, an aspiring 23-year-old DJ named Cole Efron spends his days scheming with his childhood friends and his nights working on the track that will set the world on fire. All of this changes when he meets a charismatic but damaged older DJ named James, played by Wes Bentley, who takes him under his wing. Things get complicated, however, when Cole starts falling for James's much younger girlfriend. We Are Your Friends hits theaters on August 28th. Schnett buyers sell the newest trailer for We Are Your Friends. Well, all I can really say about this is <laughs> I know that people don't really read books anymore. And I understand that our society as a whole is going down in a giant pitfall of flames and this is indicative <laughs> of the destruction of society as we know it. When I saw this trailer the first time, the first kind of music video y, like super jump cutty one. We yeah, are like, your friends. It was like, oh, it's an interesting music video. And yeah, you know, but this trailer alone to me just shows you how vapid our society is. Like, why would you even have a movie this stupid being made or produced? It's like, and even just the concept alone, it is definitely like, you know, you can make it if you put all your energy into something simply by being a DJ. And I'm not ripping on being a DJ. Being a DJ is does require talent. You're able to mix things and get a you know a, everyone jumping and having a good time and, and you know musically uh, coherent, so to speak, be able to play something like as opposed to a bunch of bad music. You know, you have a good DJ, right? <laughs> but what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Is is how how like meaningless this film looks just from the trailer alone. It looks beyond the like vapid is the only word I could really think of. Is like when you have one guy's like, kid, I'm gonna help make you a star, and just shows a kid playing in front of a group of people, and then another guy's like, I'm gonna take everything away from you. Shows a kid playing in front of a group of people. <laughs> And it's like, so one of the guys who's in charge of this horrible, soulless club kind of creation is a bad guy, and the other guy's the good guy doing the same thing, and it's still all about making money, but only don't lose your friends on the way up to making all this money doing kind of meaningless stuff. I give up. Is that a sell then? <laughs> it's an incredible sell. Yeah. Mark, what about you? Uh, yeah, I, I got to sell it as well. When I saw the first trailer for Where Are Your Friends, I was like, okay, I see where we're going here. There, there's some potential. It's a role that Zach Efron is going to use to try to branch out of what people perceive him as, but still retain some of that market that might really be into DJ house music. Seeing this trailer, it didn't elevate anything for me. It seemed like the story got even more cookie cutter. This is every, this is every like, like, like run of the mill boxing or sports movie that you'd ever want to see where one guy rises up amongst his friends maybe there's going to be some jealousy there somebody takes him under his wing but oh wait who is that somebody oh he's got a hot chick with him i'll sleep with that chick and upset that guy and then we're going to have to patch everything up and maybe cut some people out of my life are and you describing life around the movie talk offices or this is, yeah this is basically how i met ashley is this story um and it just doesn't it doesn't intrigue me at all again i'm not the i'm not a fan of that kind of music but i don't think you you should have to be to want to see a good picture based upon this. It just seems like it's a bunch of people who don't want to do any real work. They're done with doing manual labor. So, oh, I know, here's a way out. As opposed to really embracing and loving what they do, it seems like they're just taking the easy road. I'm sure the movie isn't gonna have that message, right? I don't know. Mm. It's, I, I just don't see it doing that well. I don't see there being a huge market for this movie. The trailer is supposed to advertise the movie. Didn't really sell me on it. All right, I'm going to describe for you a film. Mm. In this film, there's an aspiring young artist who cuts some sort of track and catches the attention of somebody in power who promises them money and fame and glory but in order to achieve that there's some alienation among their group of friends that have stuck with them all through thick and thin up until this point and ultimately the artist has to face this dilemma do I stay loyal and true to myself and my friends or do I pursue that gold brass ring now am I describing we are your friends or am I describing as one of you two guys pointed out in our pre-production meeting gem and the holograms <laughs> the, it's, the answer is 
Yes, it's both. I just and look. Everybody knows I am maybe to a point irrationally the world's biggest defender of Zac Efron. Mm -hmm. I think this guy has way more talent than people give him credit for, and I think he's going to be a major, like, serious actor for us with us for a long time. I just don't think a lot of people recognize it yet. But what the hell are you thinking? This movie looks awful. Where is the movie about the young kid who decides, you know what, I'm going to put my nose down, I'm going to work hard in school, and I'm going to achieve these great things, and I'm going to go, I'm going to get into the best college. I have these goals and these dreams of being a doctor and curing diseases. Where's the, I want to be a DJ. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have to effing go to work. I want to. I want to. I want like look, and I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to bash DJs at all. I mean, look, I hang out in Vegas a lot, man. Good DJs are diamonds when you for a club and stuff. I'm not. I'm not doing any of that. But where are those movies about the real kids who do real work and really dedicate themselves to really doing something? It's like, man, I don't like having a regular job. I'm gonna go sleep with my boss's girlfriend. I just, I just don't get it. I cannot get into this trailer. Whatsoever for me, Zach. I still love you, dude. But <laughs> sell. Mm -hmm. Actually, did you see this trailer? I I saw it actually in theaters a while ago, and you know I wonder if this movie's actually going to do well because this sounds like seventy five percent of the kids I went to high school with. So it's it's like probably really <laughs> relatable to a lot of people. The idea is like ridiculous, but I feel like everyone's trying to be a DJ right now. So yeah. it might speak yeah. to a lot of people. The being a DJ is I've got the app on my phone. Right. Once yeah. again, like I mentioned, the destruction of society as right. you know exactly. it. This a movie should not be called Where wanna... Are Your Friends. This movie should yeah. be called Why America Is Losing. Can I <laughs> can I just have a job if I play music? <laughs> can yeah. you just pay me Man, to sit and around? Look, I look, I understand that Zach Efron is only 27 years old. I understand he's only 27 years old, but in actuality, the dude looks a lot more mature than that. This looks more like it should be a movie about a guy figuring out how to make money to pay his child support payments <laughs> right. than how he's gonna be a DJ. You know what, I, I mean, do like, like that they showed him like sampling different sound effects and like cutting stuff and Pro Tools and stuff, so kudos to that. At least they showed you there is a craft to DJing. Now, who knows? Right. Who knows? We always got through this disclaimer and watch this now. The movie's gonna be awesome. And we're all eating. And we're all eating, eating our, words. our words. I hope we are. I like Wes Bentley as an actor too. I Me think that too. dude's got a yes. lot of talent that has not been realized quite to its potential over the years. So I want to see him be great in a role. I like Zac Efron. Guy's got incredible abs. Makes me want to do sit-ups. I want the movie to be good. I just don't think it's gonna be. The superimposed titling all look to be spelled correctly. I mean, yes. there are there, <laughs> there are, are some things. There things. are positive things about this trailer. There are positive <laughs> things. All right, what's next? According to The Hollywood Reporter, the upcoming Star Trek film, Star Trek Beyond, is looking to ramp up its action talent and have just cast the Raid star Joe Taslam to appear in the film. Nothing yet is known of Taslam's role. Star Trek Beyond is scheduled for release on July 8, 2016, which is just two months to the day before the franchise's 50th anniversary. John Byer saw the addition of Joe Taslam to the Star Trek cast. Well, I buy it, especially, you know, when you're talking about trying to build up to use another sports analogy GM uh, sports analogy GMs will often look at their team and say what areas do we need to shore up where can we add more depth and more talent and if you're Star Trek what can we do hey the physical action they've done pretty well with their space action stuff like that that have made I've enjoyed the Star Trek films I know the second one had its detractors but I had a lot of fun with it and so where can we ramp it up the more physical action I think is an area and so what do we do well let's go to maybe one of the greatest physical action movies ever made and get the guy from that and put it in there so I, I buy it I think it's a good move now at the same time let's say he's playing a villain of some sorts I can just see now a I forget the guys who make the how it should have ended trailers mm -hmm. but I can just see now it's like wait our enemy is across in that ship over there and he's requesting permission to beam aboard no, just blow up the ship. We're yeah. good. Let's let's not put him within hand to hand distance of us, and, and we'll be okay. Anyway, but overall, adding this kind of talent's good. I give it a buy, Mark. Yeah, I, I give this a big buy because what do you need in Star Trek? You need, and I don't know if this guy's going to be a villain, but you already you think about who we already know in Star Trek. We really just know the good guys. We know Kirk, and we know Spock, and we know Scotty. We we know all of the, we we know them. We know Sulu. We're waiting to see who can really pose a threat to them. So if you cast this guy in a big role, I think it's probably going to be as a menacing villain, which he's perfect for. The raid is great. It's the same thing that Star Wars The Force Awakens did that got us all excited, is when they cast a bunch of actors that were in the raid too, and we're like, oh man, these fight scenes 
are, are going to be, be great. sweet. So I think it definitely ups that ante, and he's a pretty good actor, too. So I think it's a credit to Star Trek Beyond, whether he's a hero or a villain or he's just somebody who you don't really trust and you're not even sure if it even pans out in this movie. The action quotient for this film just went up. He's going to be a triple. Anyway, well, <laughs> I'm going to sell this because when I think of Star Trek, I think of pulse pounding action and hand to hand combat. No, I don't. <laughs> I think of human interest stories and uh, slightly higher minded type of, uh, you know, social milieu. I want to be a things. DJ. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's the opposite of that. I, it's I think that Star Trek, this new Star Trek is a an interesting uh you know thing i love the first two star treks but to me they aren't star trek they were just a different hey let's try star trek in a pocket universe and, and throw jj in there and they, they just kind of remade use star wars as like the basic remake of the first star trek and then did this kind of wrath of khan remix going with the dj remix thing <laughs> um star trek beyond just the title alone is cheesy to me and then they got a director who's an action director I got to just kind of be like, I don't know what this movie's going to be. I'm going to see it and hopefully really love it. I love the casting of this guy, but to me it just it's it's showing me that they might be going in a different a different way than Star Trek. Do you think Trek we're too be. far removed from being able to bring back the Star Trek feel because of the first two reboots or can this movie do that? I don't think it can redo it. I, I don't think it can do it. I think the, the they have to do another Star Trek that's totally different to get back the original Star Trek fans. See, here's the funny thing to me is that I watch these films and we we're I just said a little bit earlier in the show is like, look, if you're going to reboot something like a Spider-Man or whatever, make it your own, mm -hmm. you know? And when I watched that first J.J. Abrams Star Trek, it was it definitely a Star Trek made for, you know, the 2000s and I can't remember when the first Star Trek, 2009 mm -hmm. sure. or whatever. Was it made for the 2009, 2010 mm -hmm. audience? And it was made for the 2002, 2010 audience, but I still felt watching it, especially when you look at the, the the mannerisms and the interactions and the characters of Bones and Spock and how they all interacted together with James Kirk and even though uh, you know we look at Spock and and Zach uh, uh, I forget the actor who played uh, Quinto. Spock. Qu Quinto yeah. Zach Quinto um, he very much brought a lot of Leonard Nimoy into his mm -hmm. performance when you look at Scotty he brought a lot of Dahoon into his performance and. It's interestingly enough, Captain Kirk was the one who didn't bring the mannerisms from the first one over. But because of all those things were there, I still felt like it was Star Trek. But it was a different Star Trek and a different first, made for a different audience at a different time. I also don't necessarily think shoring up areas that might be weak. Because let's face it, the original Star Trek, they had a lot of physical action. But it was bad. Right, it was, it was Captain Kirk. One of these. Uh, oh yeah, one of the double axe handles. Uh, the Macho Man uh, double axe. Who ever does that? Yeah, that's an automatic. And, and get no hurt. kidding, they yeah. did the karate yeah, chops the, through uh, the shoulders. Yeah. Uh, it's like, well, if you're good, so they've always had it. Right. Let's maybe just do it a little better than we've done it before. But I mean, you're right. They are to two totally distinct franchises now. But I still think the feel is there for me at any rate. I want it to be, and I'm glad that Simon Pegg, who's a big sweaty nerd, he came in and did a rewrite and uh you know it's it's yeah. going in a different direction and I, I'm, I'm holding out hope that it's going to be amazing i'm just saying like when i hear news like this i have nothing against the raid or raid 2 i love both of those films it's just hearing that we added this amazing so then i when I, I heard that this morning i was like imagining like slow motion jumping shots and all this crazy action stuff that just doesn't feel like star trek to me so all right what's next with this weekend's failure of pixels, both financially and critically, many discussions have began to surface online if Adam Sandler's days as a major comedic star in Hollywood are done. Some even suggesting that we will never see a great Adam Sandler comedy again. Mark buy or sell this statement. We will see we will see a great and successful Adam Sandler comedy again. Man, is that a tough thing to buy because those are those could be two independent notions. Seeing a great Adam Sandler comedy and a financially successful Adam Sandler comedy. I mean, I, 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 I have to buy it because I just, I, for some reason, maybe it's because I grew up and I saw what he can do in movies like Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore, and Big Daddy, and The Wedding Singer. He can do this, and he can still do this, and maybe the failure of Pixels is the impetus that's going to be like, I just got to go back to what I do best. Having said that, when he made That's My Boy fairly recently, I laughed throughout that movie. It wasn't a great film, but I had fun with it, and it bombed. It did not do well at all. It was trying to sell Adam Sandler and Andy Samberg as his kid, and people just didn't want to go see the movie. And so I understand the retreating back to something like Grown Ups or Pixels, where, hey, if I'm in a movie, and my buddies are in a movie, and we have these iconic 
nostalgic video games in a movie. How can that fail? Well, it did. So it's hard for me to say it, but I just think that somewhere in him is another great comedy by Adam Sandler. I just think it, it, it can happen. I sell the statement, um, but I am with you that I want to believe it's in there somewhere. When you got a guy who gave us Happy Gilmore, and you mm -hmm. got the guy who gave us The Water Boy, and you got a guy who gave us a lot of these types of movies, those weren't flukes, you know? But let's look down his recent things of the Adam Sandler led comedies Blended, Grown Ups 2. That's my boy. Sorry, man, that movie's horrible. I got <laughs> a buddy of mine is one of the stars of that film too, and that movie's just horrible. You didn't like that? Uh, what the Vanilla Ice? Remember he had a little Vanilla Ice, Vanilla Ice was, was a high point. He was, was a high, a high point, point in the movie. But let's keep going down this list. That that was my boy, Jack and Jill, uh, ah, Grown Ups. Ah, ah. Um, don't mess with the Zohan. Yeah. I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. It's done. I, I mean, I have been saying for years now. Adam Sandler, I think, underestimates himself, and I think a lot of people underestimate it, how good he truly is at dramatic stuff. Mm -hmm. When he is playing dramatic roles, he is exceptional. I, I don't think even he realizes how good he is, and I am just really waiting for him to throw that switch on his career and go, you know what, I'm gonna go dramatic. And I'm just gonna I'm gonna commit myself, not do the odd role here. I can commit myself next three, four films I'm gonna do. I'm gonna play dramatic leads, and I think he will be a revelation to a lot of people. But I'm sorry, like two or three in a row, you're thinking maybe there's still hope. He's not like seven in a row that to me that have just failed. It's like, dude, it's time to change the game plan. And with the failure of pixels, I think you know, grown-ups and stuff like that, a lot of people were still holding on that Adam Sandler films could be great, and they went to them, but now blended. And pixels in a row, these these films are failing now. I, I think that momentum's gone too. I think he's got to change gears. Yeah, I don't think anyone goes into making a film like no, like man, this is gonna really suck. And no, it's true. Everyone, right. come on, let's make a big piece of trash. I mean, no one goes into making a film with that with that notion. And certain things happen, and maybe you're right in a, a lot of his career decisions. Like I'm one of those people who actually liked Click. That movie where you had the mm -hmm. magical remote. I liked remote. half of it. I liked the yeah. first half of the movie, and I like the second half. So, I mean, to me, it was yeah. a fun. It was reminded me of "It's a Wonderful Life." There's all. Yeah. He's, a, he's a really good actor, and like we could always bring up "Punch Drunk Love" because it's a go-to, and it's it's something that showed everyone that people who liked Adam Sandler, but even the people who didn't, were like, "Look, he can act. He can bring that if he wants to." So it's it's really a decision of if he wants to. I thought "Funny People." He was great in that. I thought he was great in Spanglish. Right, right. So there's movies that he was really good in and that were actually really good films, but the overwhelming amount of bad films that he's in kind of cloud that area where, like, you know, the last few movies that you mentioned, I did see That's My Boy, and I have to admit I did laugh out loud, even though it's a bad movie. There's some really very funny scenes in it. It at so. least got the taste of Jack and Jill. Out of your mouth. I didn't see Jack and Jack Jill. Jack and Jill so. is one of the worst experiences I've had in Whoa. life, in, inside in or life. outside Whoa. of a theater. But you take something like that and you say, okay, nobody makes a movie to suck. Right. But sometimes they make a movie because they know it'll make money and they can mail it in. That didn't happen with Pixels, even though a lot of that humor felt mailed in. So I think that if it's like, hey, these movies aren't making money anymore, we got to go back to what we do, which is actually focus on the material, you could see a great comedy again. I admit the odds are not in my favor, but. Well, I, I, I heard from a test screening that Ridiculous Six is like filled with profanity, vulgarity, disgusting horror, gross out humor. I can't wait it's to see it. It's got that bad sounds, press behind it, but. It sounds like it is just like they were like, let's just do mm -hmm. it. Like, you know, we don't have any, you know, bars around us, let's go for it. It could be a horrible mess. It could be one of the funniest things that he's done in a long time. So I hold out hope that he can come back and, you know, do a really good film and make a lot of money at the same time. So I think it's interesting that you bring up two films like Click and like uh, Funny People. Because I, I, Click, I thought was a movie with an identity crisis. It kind of changed its identity halfway through the sure. movie. Funny People, I didn't think worked. But the funny thing is, is that I do agree. I think Adam Sandler was strong in both of those. But going back to the other point, he was basically, he was playing a dramatic role in movies that were kind of meant to be comedies at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and he really shines when he does that, both in the, the aspect that he played in Click and especially in Funny People. He was playing a dramatic role in a comedy film and then Seth Rogen was there kind of offsetting all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, who knows? Watch, he's going to put out a movie next year and it's going to kill us all and bring us back to him. And oh, here's all the hope. I just really want him to commit to going dramatic and sure. see what he can do. 
All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. We take a couple of your questions every day, so Ashley, what's in the mailbag? Dan Tito writes, hey, John, have you heard George R.R. R. Martin's comments on Marvel movies? He said, while Yellow Jacket, Ant-Man's antagonist, makes a decent villain here, I am tired of this Marvel movie trope where the bad guy has the same powers as the hero. The Hulk fought the Abomination, who is just a bad Hulk, Hulk. Spider-Man fights Venom, who is just a bad Spider-Man. Iron Man fights Iron Monger, a bad Iron Man. Yawn. I want <laughs> more films where the hero and the villain have wildly different powers. That makes the action much more interesting. I think he's kind of right. What do you think? Well, I mean, everybody knows George R. R. Martin is one of the foremost authorities on comic book action. Uh, no, that being said, he's got a point. He's <laughs> got a point. But, but let's... I think also... He's stretching a little bit. Venom was not Spider-Man's first villain. That's a villain that is a natural villain that came along much later. And if you read the comic book history and understand how Venom came to be, it actually makes sense. It's not just a coincidence that here's this giant spider creature versus this. And in the cinematic universe, he went through a lot of other villains first before he got to that. When you're looking at Ant-Man, if you saw the movie, I won't give too many too many spoilers away here, but Ant-Man apparently had a lot of adventures and had a lot of foes. And... Yellow Jacket became a natural, like narrative-wise, it was a very natural and organic flow to lead to that being the big threat that he had to face. With Hulk facing Abomination, that's another problem of, well, who the hell do you put in there to fight the Hulk? I mean, who, you got to have somebody that can but match that. He didn't fight the Abomination. That was just a, the that was the second Hulk. The first Hulk he fought a cloud. Well, he thought. Uh, so, Martin, Martin stop eating all those chickens and get with it. That and was the, the second Hulk. Don't forget about the Hulk dogs. <laughs> yeah, the Hulk the dogs. Hulk that, dogs. That's kind of wildly different and creepy, right? <laughs> then, yeah. He's in between that 48th slice of pizza and he's like, I'm tired. <laughs> Yawn. These superhero dramas, I must kill another character. And savagely. Spectre Nick yeah. Nolte. Yeah, he's fighting Spectre Nick Nolte <laughs> in the water. Um, so, with the Iron Man one, once again, as an origin story, that was very natural and organic that Iron Monger would kind of be the villain. That's so what. That kind of felt natural. Though Dennis did bring up a good thing about the Ironmonger. Why exactly. did it have to be Jeff Bridges in the suit? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like he trained to fight and stuff, and all of a sudden, I'm in the suit now, Tony, fight me. You know, it's, it's a little us pushing it a little bit. That, uh, yes, I will, I will give you that. that <laughs> there were several things about that that was sure. pushing it uh, to, to bring up. Um, but I, look, I've had the thought before, too. It's like, why does this superhero have to have someone who's their exact opposite? But remember, there's that old kind of mythos in superhero movies and in comic books th themselves that kind of suggest we see this in Batman all the time that the existence of this hero is kind of what spawned the existence of that villain to want to be the pole like why does the flash have to fight the reverse flash why, right. I get it but the universes are bigger than, the, than that. And the fact that they have polar opposites kind of makes sense in some way. So I really don't see, even though I've noticed it too, I really don't see it as a problem. What do you think? Yeah, you know, it's not a problem, but I understand what he's saying. I mean, I, I agree with him a little bit where it's like, it starts to, the yawn factor increases every time. Like when you have the Avengers and they're going to fight a bunch of like uh, 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 faceless creatures, you know, like the, the Yata Chitari. It's all the same creatures, and they're all connected like a hive mind drone thing. Turn that one thing off, they all fall apart. Ultron, hive mind, one thing, all things fall apart. It's like, how many more? Like, what Avengers, you know, three? I hope Thanos doesn't have like, and now my infinity glove creates a million Thanoses <laughs> that are all controlled by my infinity glove. And they're all fighting little, you know, I mean, it's like uh, diminishing returns, the law of diminishing returns. And I think that happens with the yin yang of, you know, you created me, I created you first, that kind of Batman yeah. thing. It makes it a lot easier when you're not writing, you know, a series of books that, that get turned into successful seasons of television shows. When you have one movie that's a two-hour film, Act One, Act Two, Act Three. When you com you know, when you have the origin of the character and their villain combined, it helps tell the story. It creates a little more epicness to the story. But I agree. I mean, you could change it up. Like, uh, say, Spider-Man is fighting like maybe a character with electrical powers, like Electro. <laughs> oh, right, that happened. <laughs> um, you have you have certain things that happen, and then they work or they don't work. So you know, it it can work, and it doesn't have to be. He can fight. The thing with Ant-Man is you wouldn't have all those amazing sequences, like them fighting inside of a suitcase, if he wasn't fighting someone with the same powers. So 
it's a it's a give and take, I think. Yeah, there's something to be said for a level playing field, and now it's just <laughs> the fact that I fight for the side of good and you fight for the side of evil. That's our only difference, and then good wins. You feel you, you feel nice about yourself. The justice prevailed. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I read these comments, and I was like, George R. R. Martin is a kindred spirit. We both like boobs and dragons, and now we agree <laughs> on the villain aspect, and that's one of the points that David Ayer made at Comic-Con about his film Suicide Squad is that DC has the better villains, and sometimes it is interesting to see somebody like Superman, who has all these powers, go up against Lex Luthor, who's just this crazed rich billionaire. Same thing with Batman. Batman has neat powers. He's got a lot of money. But when he goes up against something like the Joker, while they are shades of each other mentally, they have vastly different powers and abilities. So it's nice to see a dichotomy from time to time. It's not my it's not my make or break when I go into a movie, though. When I saw Ant-Man, I wasn't like, oh, man, he's just fighting somebody like himself. It is nice right. and refreshing to see Guardians of the Galaxy, though, when you have Gamora had some similarities to the villains that they were fighting, but Star-Lord had no idea what he was getting in, into. Right. Rocket Raccoon had no idea what he was getting into. And it was fun to see all these different types of aliens and heroes and villains go at each other. So we need both of them in our world. George R. R. Martin, thank you for making the comments. Please keep cranking out some material. Yeah, <laughs> Finish that book already. Ah, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just, uh, just joking. It gets really right. irritated when people say that. <laughs> What's next? Nicholas Meyer writes, Hey, Collider crew, I was thinking about this year's Academy Awards and how stacked the best lead actor category was. While I thought all five nominees deserved their nominations, I would have still liked to see David Oyelowo, Ben Affleck, Eller Coltrane, and Jake Gyllenhaal nominated for their performances. Do you think that the Academy will or should expand the number of slots for the acting categories from five to ten? Or should they do like they did with the Best Picture nominees where it's anywhere between five and ten? Or should they not expand the slots at all. Whenever this topic kind of comes up about expanding number of nominees and things, I'm reminded of that one line in the uh, The Incredibles, when the mom says uh, to her son, "Everybody's special," and the son says, "That's just another way of saying nobody is." <laughs> and you know, there's something. What makes the Academy Awards so incredibly special, and what or the Olympics, you know, the three medals: gold, silver, bronze. There, I remember a few years ago, there was talking about creating new two new medals. Um, so there's more. When you limit it, it increases the specialness of it. It increases the prestige of it the more limited it is because it's so limited, because only five will be nominated. So when you call yourself an Academy Award nominee, like sometimes when Ashley or, or uh, Sinead read off uh, topics for the day, when they mention Academy Award nominated actor, that means something because out of five to 900 films that come out in a year, there was a year where that guy was one of the five best and that is so rare as soon as you start expanding that every additional slot you you add decreases the prestige of it just a little bit because now this i'm not just one of three or one of five i'm one of ten i'm one of twenty i'm one of thirty now in that same argument i've got a little bit of hypocrisy because at the same time i say i like having more best picture nominees Maybe that's because it's just a recognition of movies as a whole. I'm not quite sure why I feel one way about all the other categories and a different way about the best picture one. So I'm acknowledging there's a little bit of hypocrisy there, but I do feel a little bit differently about that. Maybe I'll change my mind. But yeah, anyway, that's the way I see it. Schnapp, what about you? Would you keep it at five? Would you expand it? How do you feel about it? I would keep it at five, and I actually don't like that they expanded the best picture to ten. I, mm. I feel I feel it does diminish it a little bit. You don't have to add everybody. It's like it's it's going to be. It's like you can equate it, like I, for the first time on the show, equate it to sports. Uh, like <laughs> yeah, in the Olympics, ah, in the Olympics, no one really remembers the person who won the bronze. They just remember the person who won the gold. They remember the person who yeah. won the Oscar. So you can use Oscar nominated, which is prestigious on its own, but Oscar winning is the big one. That's yeah. the one that everybody, who won the Oscars that year? That's the person whose name is on a bunch of lists forever. Then you have to go into like, you know, find it on Google. Like, who was he also nominated in 1978 for that? And you, oh, those people are amazing too. So it's the cream of the crop, basically. And you, you know, you're just gonna keep making a larger, you know, tin to keep adding, you know, boil plate. It's like, it, it, it makes sense that it's five. I don't see any reason to make more or less. Yeah, that, that sixth person who was right there, that's, that's the breaks. 
So that's like when a it's a contest. Art is a contest. Right. I mean, I'll go to sports as well as I am want to do is I'm not in favor of the NFL or the NBA or Major League Baseball expanding how many playoff teams get in because it is special to be in the playoffs. You have to earn it. Now, having said that, there's a lot more movies that are made today and have been made for the past few decades than when they originally decided, hey, let's have five best actor and best actress nominees. So it's harder. It's more competitive to get in there. That is the reason I could see four the argument that, oh, no, we need to expand it because there's so many more films being made and so many more people acting in them that we need to widen the field a little bit. Like March Badness, where they talk about going to 128 teams instead of 64 <laughs> because there's so many more teams competing that have a chance at winning. Having said that, I like keeping it at five. I'm not a huge fan of it going to ten uh, as far as the, the best pictures. It's nice to talk about more movies being Academy Award nominated, but I like to keep everything at five. I think it's a great number. And you know what? For David Oyelowo or Jake Gyllenhaal, how much did we talk about them? Yes, the, only, the, yeah. the reason why you want to win an award, it's nice to have on your mantle, but it's also so you as an actor can keep working. Mm. And that kept your name out there a long time <laughs> right. because the snubs that they received, everybody was up in arms about it, so we kept talking about how great those performances were. Mm -hmm. All right, last question of the day. Alberto Diaz writes, what are the chances of us seeing Freddy versus Jason 2? Would they cast Robert Englund, Jackie Earl Haley, or recast the roles altogether? I uh, there are two chances, slim and none. Uh, I, I really don't. And I haven't, there were periods of time over the past number of years where you heard some rumblings about maybe something can come together, but I never heard anything get to any kind of a serious point. Also at this point, let's say theoretically they were to do one. I don't think you bring back England or Jackie Earl Haley. And I love, love them both. But I think at this point, you're if you re were to redo it, you got to reboot it. You know, get rid of the stuff of the old stuff because the fans for that aren't flocking out to see it anymore and just kind of reimagine it, I guess. But I, overall, I just don't think the chances are very high. I don't know, Mark, can you see this happening? There's actually three chances. There's slim, none, and definitely going to happen, baby. <laughs> Freddy versus Jason 2. There's just too much potential here. And I didn't like the first Freddy versus Jason, especially the end where the, the wink is all I'll I say. Know, That's what, the know. wink. Are you kidding me? Yeah. The wink. Let's have a winner next time. I think you can do it, but you need fresh blood. Not in front of the screen. You need it with the people writing it. You need somebody to come in and just re-energize this franchise and say, this is what we do. We're not just going to go by the old school tropes. We're going to try to have some fresh stuff in here. Make Freddy funny still. Make Jason yeah. menacing still. But there's so much potential here. I can't see this not happening eventually. I'd love to see Robert Englund get one more crack as Freddy Krueger. I don't need Jackie uh, Hale early to be in it. I just... He didn't, I, I don't need him there. I, I want to see this. Happen. All right, I'd begin it. Here you go. Wes Craven, Wes Craven's Nightmare. Wes Craven, get on this right now. Here's right. the opening scene. Robert Englund, mm, waking up. Yeah, I want a midnight snack. Walks over, shuffles around, gets some, you know, maybe pours himself some cereal. Decides he wants to be a DJ. Yeah, he's, he's like, he's got a DJ manual. He's got the thing. He's all set up. He's like still learning. He's got the little scrubby scrub while he's watching a TV show, having some cereal. And he just gets stabbed in the throat by Jason. And that's the movie. That sounds like the end of the movie. No, that's, that's the beginning. beginning. That's okay. the beginning. It's, for, you know, it's just a Robert Englund cameo, like Scream. Oh, and then, bam, Jason's wow. back. And then you cast a brand new Freddy. Maybe yeah. he's inside Jason. You could have a whole bunch of fun. You could have those characters. I would have a super mishmash. Bring in Leatherface. Get Bruce Campbell in there. I mean, they've already done it in the comics. They've they feel like Ash. Monster Squad. Freddy they've versus had, Jason versus yeah, Ash they've is done one it in I always wanted books. to see. All those comic books are really fun. Do a Monster Squad is what I'd say. Have all those characters. I already have a T-shirt coming with Freddy and Leatherface and, and Jason, <laughs> like you know, doing the Kiss Destroyer. It's like those are iconic characters that you would love to see in a, in a movie. And I think it's totally worth it. I agree with you, Jason versus Freddy. There were parts of it that were fun, but overall, it's kind of a bummer to see that film not live up to the potential that it could be. So the potential is still there. Okay, I still don't think it's going to happen, but I also didn't want it to happen. You guys have totally changed my mind. And now I want it to happen. Still don't think it's going to, but now I want it to happen. All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films are playing over at AMC Theaters. Head on over to amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. Make sure you subscribe to Collider Video's YouTube channel, keeping up to date on all the great shows that we have here on Collider Video. And, of course, I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. Sitting over here, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. Speaking of Oscar winners, Nick Cage won an Oscar for leaving Las Vegas. He was also going to be Superman. So find out what he was going to do and the death of Superman lives what happened. You can go get it right now at www.tdoslwh.com. 
Of course, sitting over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you online? Speaking of Oscar winners, Reese Witherspoon was nominated for her performance in Wild, and I also went hiking this weekend. See the pictures <laughs> at 5150 Ellis on Twitter and Instagram. Fall tour dates are up at my website, markellislive.com. Of course, our lovely host today, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? On Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And you can find me in all the various social media networks, just at John Campia and spinning at the Hollywood Club tonight. <laughs> Make sure to bring your dancing shoes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, that'll do it for us. My name is John Taylor for Collider Video, and until next time, bye-bye. Order our soundtrack.